Chapter Four of *The Mayor of Casterbridge* by Thomas Hardy. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bruce Peary. Chapter Four. Henchard's wife acted for the best, but she had involved herself in difficulties. A hundred times she had been upon the point of telling her daughter Elizabeth Jane the true story of her life, the tragical crisis of which had been the transaction at Waden Fair when she was not much older than the girl now beside her. But she had refrained. An innocent maiden had thus grown up in the belief that the relations between the genial sailor and her mother were the ordinary ones that they had always appeared to be. The risk of endangering a child's strong affection by disturbing ideas which had grown with her growth was to Mrs. Henchard too fearful a thing to contemplate. It had seemed indeed folly to think of making Elizabeth Jane wise. But Susan Henchard's fear of losing her dearly loved daughter's heart by a revelation had little to do with any sense of wrongdoing on her own part. Her simplicity, the original ground of Henchard's contempt for her, had allowed her to live on in the conviction that Newson had acquired a morally real and justifiable right to her by his purchase though the exact bearings and legal limits of that right were vague. It may seem strange to sophisticated minds that a sane young matron could believe in the seriousness of such a transfer, and were there not numerous other instances of the same belief the thing might scarcely be credited. But she was by no means the first or last peasant woman who had religiously adhered to her purchaser, as too many rural records show. The history of Susan Henchard's adventures in the interim can be told in two or three sentences. Absolutely helpless, she had been taken off to Canada, where they had lived several years, without any great worldly success, though she worked as hard as any woman could to keep their cottage cheerful and well provided. When Elizabeth Jane was about twelve years old, the three returned to England, and settled at Falmouth, where Newson made a living for a few years as boatman and general handy shoreman. He then engaged in the Newfoundland trade, and it was during this period that Susan had an awakening. A friend, to whom she confided her history, ridiculed her grave acceptance of her position, and all was over with her peace of mind. When Newson came home at the end of one winter, he saw that the delusion he had so carefully sustained had vanished forever. There was then a time of sadness in which she told him her doubts if she could live with him longer. Newson left home again on the Newfoundland trade when the season came round. The vague news of his loss at sea a little later on solved a problem which had become torture to her meek conscience. She saw him no more. Of Henchard they heard nothing. To the liege subjects of labor, the England of those days was a continent, and a mile a geographical degree. Elizabeth Jane developed early into womanliness. One day, a month or so after receiving intelligence of Newson's death off the bank of Newfoundland, when the girl was about eighteen, she was sitting on a willow chair in the cottage they still occupied, working twine nets for the fishermen. Her mother was in a back corner of the same room, engaged in the same labor, and, dropping the heavy wood needle she was filling, she surveyed her daughter thoughtfully. The sun shone in at the door upon the young woman's head and hair, which was worn loose, so that the rays streamed into its depths as into a hazel copse. Her face, though somewhat wan and incomplete, possessed the raw materials of beauty in a promising degree. There was an under-handsomeness in it, struggling to reveal itself through the provisional curves of immaturity and the casual disfigurements that resulted from the straitened circumstances of their lives. She was handsome in the bone, hardly as yet handsome in the flesh. She possibly might never be fully handsome, unless the carking accidents of her daily existence could be evaded before the mobile parts of her countenance had settled to their final mould. The sight of the girl made her mother sad, not vaguely but by logical inference. 
they both were still in that strait waistcoat of poverty from which she had tried so many times to be delivered for the girl's sake the woman had long perceived how zealously and constantly the young mind of her companion was struggling for enlargement and yet now in her eighteenth year it still remained but little unfolded the desire sober and repressed of elizabeth jane's heart was indeed to see to hear and to understand how could she become a woman of wider knowledge higher repute better as she termed it this was her constant inquiry of her mother she sought further into things than other girls in her position ever did and her mother groaned as she felt she could not aid in the search the sailor drowned or no was probably now lost to them and susan's staunch religious adherence to him as her husband in principle till her views had been disturbed by enlightenment was demanded no more she asked herself whether the present moment now that she was a free woman again were not as opportune a one as she would find in a world where everything had been so inopportune for making a desperate effort to advance elizabeth to pocket her pride and search for the first husband seemed wisely or not the best initiatory step he had possibly drunk himself into his tomb but he might on the other hand have had too much sense to do so for in her time with him he had been given to bouts only and was not a habitual drunkard at any rate the propriety of returning to him if he lived was unquestionable the awkwardness of searching for him lay in enlightening elizabeth a proceeding which her mother could not endure to contemplate she finally resolved to undertake the search without confiding to the girl her former relations with henchard leaving it to him if they found him to take what steps he might choose to that end this will account for their conversation at the fair and the half-informed state at which elizabeth was led onward in this attitude they proceeded on their journey trusting solely to the dim light afforded of henchard's whereabouts by the fermity woman the strictest economy was indispensable sometimes they might have been seen on foot sometimes on farmers wagons sometimes in carriers vans and thus they drew near to casterbridge elizabeth jane discovered to her alarm that her mother's health was not what it once had been and there was ever and anon in her talk that renunciatory tone which showed that but for the girl she would not be very sorry to quit a life she was growing thoroughly weary of it was on a friday evening near the middle of september and just before dusk that they reached the summit of a hill within a mile of the place they sought there were high banked hedges to the coach road here and they mounted upon the green turf within and sat down the spot commanded a full view of the town and its environs what an old-fashioned place it seems to be said elizabeth jane while her silent mother mused on other things than topography it is huddled altogether and it is shut in by a square wall of trees like a plot of garden ground by a box edging its squareness was indeed the characteristic which most struck the eye in this antiquated borough the borough of casterbridge at that time recent as it was untouched by the faintest sprinkle of modernism it was compact as a box of dominoes it had no suburbs in the ordinary sense country and town met at a mathematical line to birds of the more soaring kind casterbridge must have appeared on this fine evening as a mosaic work of subdued reds browns grays and crystals held together by a rectangular frame of deep green to the level eye of humanity it stood as an indistinct mass behind a dense stockade of limes and chestnuts set in the midst of miles of rotund down and concave field the mass became gradually dissected by the vision into towers gables chimneys and casements the highest glazings shining bleared and bloodshot with the coppery fire they caught from the belt of sunlit cloud in the west from the centre of each side of this tree-bound square ran avenues east west and south 
into the wide expanse of cornland and coombe to the distance of a mile or so it was by one of these avenues that the pedestrians were about to enter before they had risen to proceed two men passed outside the hedge engaged in argumentative conversation why surely said elizabeth as they receded those men mentioned the name of henchard in their talk the name of our relative i thought so too said mrs newson that seems a hint to us that he is still here yes shall i run after them and ask them about him no 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 not for the world just yet he may be in the workhouse or in the stocks for all we know dear me why should you think that mother twas just something to say that's all but we must make private inquiries having sufficiently rested they proceeded on their way at evenfall the dense trees of the avenue rendered the road dark as a tunnel though the open land on each side was still under a faint daylight in other words they passed down a midnight between two gloamings the features of the town had a keen interest for elizabeth's mother now that the human side came to the fore as soon as they had wandered about they could see that the stockade of gnarled trees which framed in casterbridge was itself an avenue standing on a low green bank or escarpment with a ditch yet visible without within the avenue and bank was a wall more or less discontinuous and within the wall were packed the abodes of the burghers though the two women did not know it these external features were but the ancient defences of the town planted as a promenade the lamplights now glimmered through the engirdling trees conveying a sense of great smugness and comfort inside and rendering at the same time the unlighted country without strangely solitary and vacant in aspect considering its nearness to life the difference between burg and champagne was increased too by sounds which now reached them above others the notes of a brass band the travellers returned into the high street where there were timber houses with overhanging stories whose small paned lattices were screened by dimity curtains on a drawing string and under whose barge boards old cobwebs waved in the breeze there were houses of brick nogging which derived their chief support from those adjoining there were slate roofs patched with tiles and tile roofs patched with slate with occasionally a roof of thatch the agricultural and pastoral character of the people upon whom the town depended for its existence was shown by the class of objects displayed in the shop windows scythes reap hooks sheep shears bill hooks spades mattocks and hoes at the ironmongers beehives butter firkins churns milking stools and pails hay rakes field flagons and seed lips at the coopers cart ropes and plough harness at the saddlers carts wheelbarrows and mill gear at the wheelwrights and machinists horse embrocations at the chemists at the glovers and leather cutters hedging gloves thatchers kneecaps ploughmen's leggings villagers pattens and clogs they came to a grizzled church whose massive square tower rose unbroken into the darkening sky the lower parts being illuminated by the nearest lamps sufficiently to show how completely the mortar from the joints of the stonework had been nibbled out by time and weather which had planted in the crevices thus made little tufts of stone crop and grass almost as far up as the very battlements from this tower the clock struck eight and thereupon a bell began to toll with a peremptory clang the curfew was still rung in casterbridge and it was utilized by the inhabitants as a signal for shutting their shops no sooner did the deep notes of the bell throb between the house fronts than a clatter of shutters arose through the whole length of the high street in a few minutes business at casterbridge was ended for the day other clocks struck eight from time to time one gloomily from the jail another from the gable of an almshouse with a preparative creak of machinery more audible than the note of the bell a row of tall varnished case clocks from the interior of a clockmaker's shop joined in one after another just as the shutters were enclosing them like a row of actors delivering their final speeches before the fall of the curtain 
then chimes were heard stammering out the sicilian mariner's hymn so that chronologists of the advanced school were appreciably on their way to the next hour before the whole business of the old one was satisfactorily wound up in an open space before the church walked a woman with her gown sleeves rolled up so high that the edge of her under linen was visible and her skirt tucked up through her pocket hole she carried a load under her arm from which she was pulling pieces of bread and handing them to some other women who walked with her which pieces they nibbled critically the sight reminded mrs henchard newson and her daughter that they had an appetite and they inquired of the woman for the nearest baker's ye may as well look for manna food as good bread in casterbridge just now she said after directing them they can blare their trumpets and thump their drums and have their roaring dinners waving her hand towards a point further along the street where the brass band could be seen standing in front of an illuminated building but we must needs be put to for want of a wholesome crust there's less good bread than good beer in casterbridge now and less good beer than swipes said a man with his hands in his pockets how does it happen there's no good bread asked mrs henchard oh tis the corn factor he's the man that our millers and bakers all deal with and he has sold em growed wheat which they didn't know was growed so they say till the dough ran all over the ovens like quicksilver so that the loaves be as flat as toads and like suet puddin inside i've been a wife and i've been a mother and i never see such unprincipled bread in casterbridge as this before but you must be a real stranger here not to know what's made all the poor volks insides plim like blowed bladders this week i am said elizabeth's mother shyly not wishing to be observed further till she knew more of her future in this place she withdrew with her daughter from the speaker's side getting a couple of biscuits at the shop indicated as a temporary substitute for a meal they next bent their steps instinctively to where the music was playing End of chapter 4